Hello, my name is Russ Miller of Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Let me start by asking you a question. How many of you think that whether or not you believe in a global flood is vital to the Christian faith? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. You know, a lot of times nobody will raise their hand to that question, but I want you to understand why it is so important. Jesus said, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Well, what Jesus has just said is if he's told us of things that we can actually hold in our hands, that we can look at, that we can test, study, and observe the results from, and we won't even believe those things, how are we going to believe when he tells us of spiritual things or things that we can't now test, study, and observe? You know, a key question, and this really just came up in the past couple of hundred years, is how old is the earth? The Bible says, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame unto him. In other words, let's look at the facts and then let's decide what we want to trust. Moses told us in the book of Genesis that God judged man's sin with a global flood where everything in the whole earth was destroyed. I've got to tell you, if there had been a global flood, the evidence should be overwhelming. For instance, the outer crust of the earth would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock that were laid down by water, and they'd be full of billions of dead things if there had been a global flood. Did you know that the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers laid down by water, and they're full of billions of dead things that we call fossils? Exactly! What would be there had there been a global flood? Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. So I'm going to try to brainwash everybody. Is that okay? <laughs> It'll just take a minute, and then I'll unbrainwash you. Now, if you've heard this before, you know the answer. Don't say it out loud. I want everyone to really think about this, because it's going to make an important point. What would you do if you were in this person's position? A man left home jogging, and he jogged for a little ways, and he turned left, and he jogged further and turned left, and he jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed there were two masked men ahead waiting for him. So what should the jogger do? Should he turn and run the other way, yell for help, dial 911? What should the jogger do? Here's the point. If your first thought is wrong, all of your following thoughts will be way off base. So let me unbrainwash you. A man left home jogging, and he jogged for a little ways, and he turned left, and... <laughs> He jogged a little ways further and turned left, and he jogged further, turned left, and jogged back toward home. But as he was jogging home, he noticed there were two masked men ahead waiting for him. A catcher and an umpire, right? So what should he do? Slide. Slide, absolutely. But the problem is this. If your first thought was wrong, all of your following thoughts were way out in left field, weren't they? You would have been misled or brainwashed. And the fact of the matter is that that we can tell a six-year-old anything and they're going to believe us, as they should be able to. And for the past 50 to 100 years, we've been telling our six-year-olds that everything is millions and billions of years old. In fact, this is a high school biology book. It says, kids, evidence certifies that planet Earth is more than four billion years old. Well, the Bible says to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So let's look at some evidence about the age of the Earth. You've all heard of carbon dating. It's one of the more popular of the radiometric dating techniques. It's used on organic remains, plant and animal remains. And it measures the amount of carbon-14 in these remains. Carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere. And during the process of photosynthesis, plants breathe in very trace amounts of carbon-14. It's part of the CO2 they breathe in. Now, once an, an animal eats the plant, it also becomes a part of their tissue. So all of us have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. However, once a plant or an animal dies, it stops eating, right? So it stops taking in carbon-14. And carbon-14 decays away over time. Now, there's some argument over the exact amount of time, but most scientists that work with the dating methods agree that in measurable amounts, C14 should be gone in 50 to 70,000 years. Well, therefore, you can't carbon date something older than that. There wouldn't be any carbon-14 left to measure. 
But the inventor of the C14 dating method estimated that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere would reach equilibrium with the amount decaying away after about 30,000 years. So they think that the amount in the atmosphere is in equilibrium. So by comparing the amount in an item in the ground with the amount in the atmosphere, they say it's taken this long to decay away. And that's how they date things. And that sounds reasonable, except for several problems. Number one, scientists have shown extremely large changes in atmospheric C14. It's not in equilibrium. So when they're comparing it to the atmosphere, which is changing, it gives them erroneous dates. For instance, they dated living penguins at 8,000 years old. Living snails were dated 27,000 years old. A frozen mammoth was found. The front leg was 40,000 years old, and the back leg was 26,000 years old. <laughs> and the wood it was laying on was supposed to only be 10,000 years old. That just doesn't make any sense. This is from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. The troubles of the radiocarbon dating method are undeniably deep and serious. Half of the dates are rejected. There are gross discrepancies, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. Wait, wait a minute. Selected dates? You mean they just pick out a date they want something to be? <laughs> Basically, yes. Well, where do they pick it from? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let me give you an example of them picking a date. A human skull, a modern human skull, was found under rock. Well, they had already dated the rock at almost a quarter of a billion years old. But they said humans only evolved to this level in the last million or so years. So did they admit that the old Earth dates don't work and Darwinism is, is finished? No, they just redated the rock from a quarter of a billion years to less than two million years, based on nothing other than their need to fit the evolutionary story. This is not science. This is religious bias undermining real science. So where do they pick the date from? We'll get to that in just a minute. Most of the radiometric or radioisotope dating methods are used on igneous or metamorphic rock. They think the melting process sets the date back to zero, from an isotope standpoint. Potassium argon is one of the most common. It's a scientific fact that potassium-40 decays into argon-40. And it's a fact that a scientist who deals with the isotope dating methods can crush up a rock and very accurately the me measure the amount of potassium and argon. But at this point in time, the science ends because there are up to 10 to 23 wild guesses, they call assumptions, that must be made to come up with old dates. For instance, they have to assume, since they're measuring the amount of argon and saying it took this long to form, that the rock had no argon in it when it first formed. Well, who is there to test the rock when it first formed to see if it had argon in it? Nobody. That's a wild guess. And if it had argon in it, it'll date millions or billions of years older than it really is. They also assume the rock laid there for their supposed millions or billions of years and was never contaminated with the potassium or the argon, which would throw out the dates again by millions or billions of years. You know, and contamination can be caused during a flood, by water trickling across rocks, by, by pressure, by earthquakes, etc. And of course, they assume God had nothing to do with anything, which biases the method before they start. And that's just three of their up to 23 wild guesses, any one will throw out the dates. For instance, rocks that formed 200 years ago in a lava flow in Hawaii were sent to labs for testing. They got 12 different dates on the rock. The youngest age came back at 325 million years old. The oldest age was 3 billion years old. And the average of the 12 dates was 1.5 billion years old. The rocks weren't even 200 years old at that time. So let me ask you a question. Where do they get the 4.6 billion year age of the Earth that they teach kids today? Well, believe it or not, they get it from dating meteorites, which they don't know where or when the meteorites formed. Here's an interesting fact about meteorites. They're only found in the top few strata layers. Oh, wait a minute. If the layers formed slowly and laid there for millions of years, shouldn't meteorites be found throughout all the layers, even more in the lower layers? Why are they only found in the top few layers? Because those layers were laid down by, very quickly in a global flood about 4,400 years ago, and only the top few have been exposed to meteorite impact. No wonder the Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, 
after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Things to consider about the isotope dating methods. When they date rocks that we know when they formed, the methods don't work. But when we date rocks, then we don't know the age of the rock, like a meteorite, we are supposed to believe that they do work. That's religious bias masquerading and undermining real science. Bad dates are the rule. They date a rock over and over again until they get a good date that they select. So what's their definition of a good date? Well, that's a date that matches the man-made geologic column or time scale. The geologic column is the Bible. This is where the old earth beliefs truly come from. Back in the early 1800s, shortly after George Washington passed away, some scientists started saying, wait a minute, those sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water didn't form in a flood. They formed slowly over millions and billions of years. So they assigned each layer of rock a name, an age, and index fossils, like this fish the arrow is pointing to. And the index fossils supposedly went extinct while that layer was being laid down. Well, therefore, he should never be found in the upper layers. So anytime they find that particular fossil, the index fossil, they assign everything in that layer the age that they gave the index fossil. Well, where did they get the age for the index fossil? This was back when modern transportation was a fast horse, when they thought a cell was just a simple gelatin-like substance. Where did they get the ages? They made them up. They just chose ages that they wanted. In fact, this book on page 306 tells the kids we date the rock by the fossil found in it. Well, where do they get the age of the fossil? Or on page 307, they tell the kids, we date the fossil by the rock it's found in. We date the rock by the fossil, and the fossil by the rock. It's a total circular argument. If I were to give you two pieces of limestone, and I told you one of these formed a year ago, and the other formed 500 million years ago, how would you tell the difference? I mean, limestone's limestone. How would you tell the difference? By the fossils that were found in the layer of rock. They date the rock by the fossils. For instance, lobe fin fish were index fossils for rock up to 325 million years old. So any rock layer found with the lobe fin fish fossil in it and everything in the layer was dated 325 million years old. Except they found the coelacanth, the lobe fin fish, alive 70 years ago. Not extinct for 300 plus million years. So either that fish refutes the old earth dating methods or that scuba diver is 325 million years old. <laughs> and choose for yourself what you want to believe. In fact, it's really interesting because the fossil record is a total embarrassment to evolution. They try to claim otherwise. That's total bluff and bluster. The uh, lobe fin fossil, which is supposed to be up to 300 million years old, looks just like the living fish today. In other words, there's no... Darwinian evolution found in the fossil record. It's an embarrassment to evolution. And their index fossils have been showing up alive today by the dozens. And it's totally undermined the geologic time scale. So they're trying to distance themselves from their own index fossils. But it's not just marine creatures. The Wallamy pine tree, for example, was an index fossil for rock supposedly 150 million years old, except it's been found alive in three different locations over the last six years. Not extinct for 150 million years. And an interesting thing is scientists have taken DNA from the three different groups of trees and compared them, and they're the same. If they had been separated for any appreciable length of time, they would have had adaptational and mutational losses in the gene pools, and there should be some differences. You see, those layers were laid down about 4,400 years ago. Well, the geologic column, the Bible for old earth beliefs, this is what has fooled people into believing in millions and billions of years, is only found in two places in the entire world, in the correct order of the 12 primary layers with the corresponding index fossils by which they date the layers. Do you know where the two places are that the geologic column has been found? School textbooks and museum displays. Believe it or not, the geologic column, which has misled billions of people into believing in millions and billions of years, has never been found anywhere in the real world in the order by which they date things. It does not even exist. 
this textbook admits if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, <clears throat> no such column exists. How sad. Listen to this carefully from the American Journal of Science. Think about what they are saying. The radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Well, what does the non-existent geologic column have to do with the scientific isotope dating methods? The radiometric dating techniques don't work. They pick the date from the geologic column, which doesn't exist. And people think I'm crazy for believing in a young Earth creation. Let me tell you, if there was a global flood, what it comes down to is all the old Earth beliefs are based on the strata forming slowly. The global flood wipes out the old Earth beliefs. The problem is, though, that you can tell a six-year-old anything, and they're going to believe it. And sadly, just 200 years ago, almost everybody in the world thought the Earth was only about 6,000 years old and it had been judged by a global flood. But now, almost everybody thinks everything's millions of billions of years, and the biggest compromise inside the church today is trying to fit millions of years of time into God's Word. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, there's a couple of problems. I'll talk about them in a second. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Studies today say that four out of five Christian-raised kids, your kids, your grandkids, etc., leave the faith when they leave the home. Why? Because they're being taught, since they're little kids going through school, that we evolved over millions of years of death and suffering. You see, the old earth beliefs are based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water that the young earth is based on. It depends on your worldview, how you're going to interpret those layers. And this puts death and suffering before man's sin. You see, the Bible's message is that man's, or God's perfect creation had no death, evil, or suffering in it, but our original sin separated us from God, right? And required a redeemer. Now, the first promise of a redeemer is found in Genesis 3. Verse 15, where the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And that Redeemer is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you can eliminate original sin, what's the need of the sacrifice to reunite us with God if we weren't separated from him? The Bible says there will come in the last days scoffers that will be willingly ignorant. They will choose to be ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the world that was, being overflowed with water, perished. Folks that believe in millions of years, and listen, studies say half of folks in church believe in millions of years of time. I used to be a theistic evolutionist. That's a person that thinks God used evolution in millions of years of time. I'm not here to attack anyone that believes in that. I'm here to help you. If you're really seeking the truth of God's word, let me show you where we've been misled, and your faith can skyrocket. But the Bible predicts people will deny the global flood. Anyone that believes in millions of years says, what about the global flood? It wasn't a global flood, it was a local flood. Well, why do they care if it was a global flood or a local flood? Most people can't articulate this, but it's because all old earth beliefs are based on the strata forming slowly. If there was a flood, it wipes out every old earth belief. That's how important that global flood is. Now, if it was just a local flood, that really causes some problems for Scripture because God made a covenant with Noah and said that he'll never more judge the world by water, whereby destroying all flesh. Well, if it was a local flood, we have local floods all the time. There's a problem with that. American Atheist Magazine understands this quite well. They said, if there was never an original sin, there's no need of salvation. And that puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. They understand it quite well. This progressive creationist from Wheaton College stated, and think about what he's saying here, Genesis... By itself, Genesis without consideration suggested by science, and by that he means the isotope dating methods and the geologic column, Genesis by itself is that God created the heavens and the earth in six solar days. In other words, the word of God says it was a six-day creation, six consecutive days, and the genealogical records add up to about 6,000 years ago. The Bible warns that in the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Oh, I, I believe in God, but well, he couldn't have created like he says he did. He, 
He had to create over millions and billions of years. The secular scientists say so. You see, we, we can't use secular science to interpret God's word. We need to use God's word to interpret whether or not secular science is correct or not. No wonder the Bible says, teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Did you know the Bible says, don't give heed to endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying? But after their own lust, will they heap to themselves teachers that will teach their itching ears what they want to hear, and they'll turn away from the truth and be turned to fables. Well, fables are fairy tales, right? I used to tell my son fairy tales all the time. I used to tell him that a frog could turn into a handsome young prince, a human with a magic ingredient, which was what? A kiss from a princess, right? Well, evolutionists have taken over the same fairy tale, but they say, wait a minute, a frog can turn into a handsome young prince, but it doesn't take a kiss from a princess. It takes millions and billions of years of time. The magic ingredient for Darwinism. Anytime you hear something that starts out millions of years ago, what you're really hearing is once upon a time because a fairy tale is about to follow. Let me ask you a question. Who's ever seen anything take millions of years? Nobody. That's a religious belief. Anyone's belief in the age of the earth comes down to how they believe the strata layers formed. Slowly over millions of years of death and suffering before man's sin or quickly during a global flood after man's sin. Ephesians tells us, Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Moses said that there was a global flood that destroyed everything off the face of the earth. And the waters prevailed and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. That is a global flood. Flood. There was nothing local about it. And the majority of evidence points to the global flood. So let's take a look at a global flood theory. So let's take a look at a global flood theory. I want you to realize that this is just a theory. God doesn't tell us exactly how he created the flood. He gives us some hints, but we're going to look at a viable theory, and there are several good theories out there, but I'm going to use this as a vehicle to show you overwhelming evidence of the global flood and thus the young earth creation. First of all, God had shut Noah and the animals safely on board the ark. At this time, a huge meteor of a rock core with an ice shell was hurtling through our solar system towards the earth. Most folks don't realize it, but huge ice meteors hit the atmosphere almost daily. Some are the size of five-story buildings, but they melt as they're coming through the atmosphere. Now, debris was making up the tail of the comet. The tail would have been leading the way due to the solar winds pushing it ahead of the comet. Well, debris, chunks of various size of ice, were being pulled in by the various planets by their gravitational pulls causing cratering on the moon and Mercury and forming rings around Saturn and leading to flooding on the planet Mars. The craters on the moon and Mercury are predominantly on one side of the planet. They're not evenly distributed as if it were hit by random chance over millions or billions of years. This book says Saturn's rings are made of rock and ice. Did you know that Saturn is losing its ring? And in fact, at the rate it's losing that ring, it should be gone in less than a million years. It can't be billions of years old. According to Scientific American, think about this, canyons on Mars, larger than Grand Canyon, formed in just a few short weeks during a global flood. Well, there, we don't know of a liquid drop of water existing on Mars, and they admit there was a global flood that forms canyons very quickly, but they say on Earth, and we're 71% covered by, our surface is covered by water, and they say there was never a global flood here. That's religious bias, that's not science. Science Journal reports the vast canyons and river valleys on Mars may have been carved out following giant meteor impacts. Well, what kind of a meteor would cause flooding on a planet that doesn't have water? An ice meteor that later melts, causes flooding, and either is soaked in or evaporates away. Well, as a comet approached the Earth, its speed increased, causing the outer shell of ice to shatter. The inverse square law basically states that as two of 
attracting objects get closer and closer, there's a multiplying effect on that attraction. So the comet would have been picking up speed. It would have get, gotten going so fast it would have shattered. And this is what happened to the comet that struck Jupiter back in 1994. It broke up into about 28 pieces before impact because of the increasing speed. Well, ice and snow from the shattered shell fell to the Earth. Most of it was diverted to the poles by the magnetic field. Did you know that frozen bobcats and, and camels and bison and rhinos and woolly mammoths and horses and wolves are found by the thousands buried in ice from Siberia across to Alaska? Nature Magazine reports the region may not always have been covered in ice, fitting with our pre-flood theory, by the way. The Chronicle of Higher Education states the discovery of well-preserved leaves in Antarctica has sparked a debate over whether the polar region enjoyed a near-temperate climate in the past. Hmm. And they say that unlike fossils, which leave only mineral traces, the leaves retain their original cellular structure and organic content. That's because they were buried in ice before they could rot away. Well, the ice pounded down on the poles, shooting out streams of ice to begin the Ice Age effects. If I had a big ball of snow and I dropped it off the platform, it would hit the ground and just shoot out arms in all directions and come to a stop. Well, if you believed in uniformitarianism, and that's prophesied in 2 Peter 3, verse 3 through, verses 3 through 6, that scoffers will come in the end claiming all processes remain the same, uh, you could come along and measure the two-foot-long arm of ice and see it's not hardly moving at all and say it took millions of years to move this far. But you'd be wrong. It happened very quickly, and today's processes are not the same as past processes. The Bible says the same day were the fountains of the great deep broken up. Most folks think that the flood water came from above, but most of the flood water came from below when the great fountains of the deep erupted. In fact, the book of Jasher is not a biblical book, but it's referred to twice in Scripture, and it says all the foundations in the earth were broken up. And the cracks circle the earth in a matter of hours, shooting scalding hot mud and water into the atmosphere, producing torrential rainfalls. This is a map of the worldwide fault lines, like San Andreas Fault, which I suggest are probably scars left over from where the fountains of the deep erupted. You know, clams are found in the lowest strata layers that contain fossils, and we're told that that's because they evolved first. They're one of the oldest index fossils. Well, I say clams are at the bottom because they lived at the bottom of the ocean and were the first things buried. I mean, clams aren't very smart. Have you ever talked to one? <laughs> if you said, hey, there's going to be a flood in two weeks, you need to get out of here, they probably would have ignored you. And if they didn't, how far could they have gone, right? So, of course, they're found at the bottom. You know, they find clam beds 10 feet thick, and the fossilized clams are in the closed position. Well, if you go to the beach, most of the shells you find die and open up and get washed up. They're, they're open, right, in the open position. Why are most of these fossilized clams in this closed position? Because they were still alive when they got buried very suddenly by the muds pouring forth from the, as the fountains of the deep erupted. Well, fish fossils are found by the millions, buried in what's called and packed in what's called diatomaceous earth. We use diatomaceous earth for various uh, uh, end uses like insulation, pool filters. A lot of cat litter is made up of diatomaceous earth. This is made of tiny marine creatures with a glass body, and when they die, that microscopic little body floats to the bottom of the ocean. Well, evolutionists say that diatomaceous earth forms at one inch per 10,000 years. Well, how do you find a four-inch thick fish buried in diatomaceous earth fossilized? I mean, what, he laid on the bottom for 40,000 years waiting for diatoms to build up around it? That doesn't make any sense. I say when the fountains of the deep erupted, those scalding waters killed everything within a couple hundred miles of the fissures, and the diatoms and the dead fish rained to the bottom, forming very quickly. In fact, an entire whale was found packed in diatomaceous earth. It had to have formed quickly, not slowly. Pure salt deposits have been found that are hundreds of feet thick that cover thousands of square miles. Pure salt, no impurities in them. But seawater contains microscopic plants and animals. How can you form pure salt deposits? Well, I suggest as the hot fountains of the deep are erupting, the hot salt brines encounter cold ocean waters 
and the salt quickly precipitated out to form the pure salt deposits. In fact, pure deposits like this have been seen to have formed in conjunction with volcanic activity. Insects have been found in salt crystals. We were told the salt crystals are 250 million years old. But scientists have been able to take bacteria out of those insects and revive the bacteria. There's no way they laid there for a quarter of a billion years. Those layers were laid down about 4,400 years ago in a global flood. Biological materials decay rapidly in nature. Scientists say most of these should be gone in less than 10,000 years at, in, under the best of circumstances. And yet, in fossils that we are told are up to 300 million years old, scientists have found DNA, red blood cells, soft tissues, amino acids, etc. There's no way those things could be old. Back to the flood theory, the scalding hot waters of the fountains of the deep completed the ice age effects. Think about this logically. The hot fountain oceans warmed up the oceans. The flood waters were probably about 30 to 40 degrees warmer than today's oceans. Warm water leads to massive evaporation. And the cloud cover was raining down over the, the equator and when it went across the poles it was pouring down snow with which led to the ice caps that we have today. And the Ice Age was upon the Earth. Well, how are we told that the Ice Age formed? We're told the Ice Age formed during a cooling cycle. Well, that would have cooled down the oceans, wouldn't it? Where did the evaporation come from that led to the ice on the poles? That just doesn't even make sense. Have you, you've heard of global warming, I'm sure. Well, they say we've got to destroy the U.S. economy because of global warming. Well. They say the ice caps are melting, but if you look at a map where the ice caps used to come, they used to come down to what's Kansas City, Missouri today. They're 2,000 miles north of there. There's nothing new about the ice caps melting. That's been going on for about 4,000 years now. The masses of ice and the raging fountains brought down the water that was above the firmament in the original creation. And we talk about this in our pre-flood theory, but the Bible says the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights as this window of heaven came down. Now from the start of the flood, the land mass began to part. The upperly exploding waters were eroding the edges of those cracks, producing a muddy flow. And plants and animals were buried very quickly in stratified sedimentary layers of rock to form today's rock layers coal uh, deposits and fossils. Things must be buried very quickly to become fossilized, otherwise they rot away or get eaten by scavengers, like this ichosaur that was buried while giving birth. Obviously something very catastrophic and sudden took place. But our kids are taught, in fact anyone under the age of 80 has been taught, that fossils take millions of years to develop. Let me ask you a question. Uh, who's ever seen a fossil form over millions of years? Nobody. Now, if I can show you just one example of a fossil forming in less than a million years, then I have scientifically refuted this false teaching, correct? Well, a miner left his hat in a mine in New Zealand, came back about 10 years later, and the hat had turned to solid stone. Uh, is 10 years, is that the same thing as millions of years? Well, students are also taught that strata layers form slowly over millions of years of time. Let me ask you a question. Who's ever seen a strata layer form over millions of years of time? Nobody. Nobody. That's a religious belief. But if I can give you just one example of strata layers forming quickly, then I have scientifically refuted this teaching, correct? No. Absolutely. You can go down to the toy store and you get those little glass and colored deals with the different colored grains of sand in them, and you flip it over and instantaneously you get hundreds of finely stratified layers. You flip it over the other way, instantaneously you get hundreds of finely stratified layers. It doesn't take long periods of time for things to stratify. The floodwaters were laying down layers and picking them up and laying them down and picking them up and stratifying the layers out very quickly, not slowly over millions of years of time. We talked about the carbon dating and how the carbon-14 should be gone in measurable amounts in about 70,000 years or so. Well, recent testing has shown that all the fossil-bearing layers that we are told are almost 600 million years old down to the Cambrian still have carbon-14 in them. That means that all those fossil-bearing layers 
had to have formed in the last few thousand years. Oh, and even better, the range of amount of carbon-14 from the top layer all the way down to the bottom of the Cambrian is in the same range of amounts. That means all those layers formed in the same event. And nothing but a global flood can explain that. Scientifically, it's a done deal. And if there's a young Earth creation, it wipes out every old Earth belief, including every religion that has accepted old Earth beliefs any pantheistic, evolution-based religion, etc. About seven years ago in China, scientists discovered a fossilized fish in the bottom of the Cambrian. Well, the problems for evolution are quite huge on this. You see, the Cambrian supposedly only had single-cell critters in it. The fish doesn't give evolution time to have taken place. The fish has gills, eyes, a central nervous system. Evolutionists say that this didn't evolve for hundreds of millions of years here. So this had the communist, atheist, Chinese scientists calling the American scientists closed-minded bigots because they wouldn't consider the fact that we just might have been created. In fact, out of frustration, the lead Chinese scientist stated that in China, we can criticize Darwin, but not the government. In America, you can criticize your government, but not Darwin. <laughs> very accurate statement and a very sad statement that needs to be changed. Have you ever been to Yellowstone National Park? You can visit Specimen Ridge if you go there. I ran into an ex-pastor a few years ago who had gone to Specimen Ridge, became convinced the world was hundreds of millions of years old and lost his faith. He should have seen this simple presentation. You see, at Specimen Ridge, you'll be shown 26 different strata layers. Each one has fossilized tree stumps coming up out of it. And the story you're going to be told is that a forest grew and was wiped out by a catastrophic event. And then over millions of years, another forest grew and was eventually wiped out by another catastrophic event. And on and on this goes for 26 different forests representing hundreds of millions of years. However, these are just polystrata fossils that traverse multiple strata layers. Now, if each layer was laid down slowly over millions of years, how do they explain these polystrata fossils like these tree fossils? Some of these trees are upside down. Are we supposed to believe a tree turned itself upside down and balanced itself there for a few million years waiting for strata to build up around it? That doesn't make any sense. But during the global flood, trees were uprooted and they floated in the horizontal position on the surface. Eventually, they waterlogged to the point, usually the root end because it's denser, and it would turn and float in that upright position until it waterlogged to the point it sank to the bottom bouncing against the bottom as sediments quickly came in and buried them in different sedimentary layers, looking like they grew at different times. Coal is almost always found in layers. That's the reason they strip mine coal. The story the kids are told in school is that a swamp formed, and over millions of years, peat formed, and then the layer uplifted, the water drained off, and over millions of years, a strata layer formed, and then the layer sank, and the water came back in, and up and down this goes for representing millions and millions of years of time. They don't tell kids that most coal is made of plant material that doesn't grow in swamps. But how do they explain branching coal seams, where a branch of coal goes from the lower layer through the strata layer into the upper layer? How do they explain that if they form slowly over millions of years? That doesn't make any sense. But during the flood, massive mats of vegetation floated on the surface. These could have been 10,000 miles in diameter. And as they floated along, they were raining organic debris to the bottom, forming future coal layers that were quickly buried by following sediments. Well, eventually, the tides turned, and they retraced their steps, laying down another layer of coal. But at the point of turn, they left behind branching coal seams that connected the lower layer through the strata layer into the upper layer, and that makes perfect and logical sense. Whirlpools deposited piles of plants and animals, which are today's natural gas and oil deposits, and fossil graveyards. Have you heard the term fossil graveyard before? That's where literally thousands of different critters are buried together in a small geological region. Oftentimes their bones are intertwined. Well, how do you explain that over millions of years? We don't see animals traveling for tens of thousands of miles to die in piles on top of each other. And even if they did, they'd rot away. They'd be eaten by scavengers. But during the 
flood, dead animals floated and got caught up in whirlpools, oftentimes mixing their bones together and burying them in the same geological area very quickly to form fossil graveyards, proof of the global flood and the young earth creation. Incriminating human artifacts are found in various layers, and this has been known for a long time. This is from Scientific American back in 1940. Geologists refused to accept the evidence at face value because if man existed as far back as the Carboniferous period, then the whole science of geology is so completely wrong that all geologists would resign their jobs. What the problem is, is they're basing their, their findings on a religious belief that the layers formed slowly over millions of years. The layers form quickly in a global flood, and if they looked th at things through the biblical worldview, it would improve science greatly. Back to the flood theory. The impact and weight of ice on the poles caused the earth to wobble for a couple of thousand years. The book of Jasher stated, On that day the Lord God caused the whole earth to shake, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently. The global flood and the power of this event was, is way beyond our comprehension. This one astronomer studied ancient solstice shadows recordings, and he says it looks like something struck the earth about 4,350 years ago, causing the earth to wobble violently for about 2,000 years. It stabilized that spin right about the time Jesus came, and there's probably a message there. I just haven't figured out exactly what it is. But this says, scientists have found evidence that Earth may have wobbled like an out-of-balance ball 84 million years ago. Well, that's their religious belief. It was about 4,000 years ago. The textbooks say Earth's axis wobbles like that of a spinning top. Well, the Earth's wobble stabilized at a tilt, and today the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees on the axis. But near the end of the flood, the fractured plates of the Earth shifted apart violently. Kids are taught about Pangaea, continental drift, and how that represents hundreds of millions of years. I get asked by students all the time about this. The evidence they, they have is that the Earth's plates appear to be moving. We're not positive. They might be wobbling back and forth. And the shapes of the continents seem to fit. They, here's a drawing out of the textbook, and they say, look, Africa and South America seem to be a perfect fit. Well, they do in the drawing. What they don't tell the kids is that Africa had to be shrunk by about a third to make that fit perfect because South America is actually too small to be a perfect fit. Well, why is South America too small? Because a lot of it was eroded by the erupting fountains of the deep and are now parts of the sedimentary layers we find around the globe today. But kids are taught that plate tectonic processes lead to mountain building over millions of years of time. But the Bible says they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. This means that the mountains arose and the valleys sank down toward the end of the flood. If you look at the Earth's crust, the layers under the oceans only average about three to four miles thick. The layers under the continents are about 30 to 35 miles thick. Those thin layers were over the fountains of the deep in the original creation. But during the flood, the fountains had erupted and now these heavy waters were on top of those thin layers that were over empty chambers. And toward the end of the flood, they collapsed jutting the mountains upward, forming the ocean basins as the mountains arose and the valleys sank down. Did you know the world's tallest mountains, like Mount Everest, the tops are littered with seashells? I live at 7,000 feet above sea level, and Flagstaff is littered with various marine fossils. They were vaulted there quickly at the end of the flood, but here's a, a modern college textbook trying to undermine your kids' faith. They're going to say, kids, those clams you find on top of those mountains, they would have needed far longer than the 40-day duration of the biblical flood to climb up a steep mountainside. Well, I've got to admit, clams would need more than 40 days to climb up a mountainside. I'm not arguing that, but they didn't climb up any mountainside. They were vaulted there when the mountains arose and the valley sank down. And if they're going to attack the Word of God, could they at least know what God's Word said? The, the flood lasted for almost a year uh, it just rained down the windows of heaven for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, the textbooks correctly teach you can't bend rock. If I had a piece of shell that was a foot wide and an inch thick and 10 feet long, and I stood on one side and it went off the edge of the stage, and, and these two folks got on the other side, would it slowly bend down to the ground? It would snap, wouldn't it? You can't bend rock. Rock would snap. 
Yet we find geologic compression events around the globe where hundreds of feet of finely stratified layers like this entire mountain range are squished together like an accordion with up to 160 degree bends in the rock. How do you bend a rock like this without breaking it? The rocks are bent, but they're not broken. That's because they were still moist sediments at the end of the flood. They were mud when the mountains arose and the valleys sank down. Well, the rock core came on through the magnetic field and slammed into the earth. Scientists think, and there's a lot of speculation here, that there might be a buried crater 112 miles in diameter on the Yucatan Peninsula. They say if it's there, it would have taken a rock about six miles in diameter to make that impact. Well, the runoff eroded canyons in the still soft sediments. We're told the Grand Canyon formed slowly over millions of years as the Colorado River eroded the canyon, right? Well, there's all kinds of problems with that. We do Grand Canyon bus tours based on the three-day formation of Grand Canyon, by the way. One of the major problems is where the river enters a canyon, it's a mile below the top of the canyon. Water doesn't flow uphill, by the way. I point that out. But there's awesome proof of the global flood at Grand Canyon. When people stand at the Grand Canyon looking down, I tell them, you are looking the wrong way. Turn around and look behind you. You've got two buttes, Cedar Butte and Red Butte, that are both 900 feet tall above the rim of the canyon. When you're standing on the rim of the canyon, there used to be 900 feet of strata on where, top of where you're standing. It's gone for thousands of square miles except for these two buttes. The last time the waters ran off, they eroded those 900 feet, leaving no evidence of where they've gone. Those two little buttes clung on. Oh, and even more impressive, there used to be 4,000 feet of layers on top of those 900 feet. There is a mile deep strata layer missing from the top rim of Grand Canyon, gone for thousands of square miles. They picked them up in the Grand Staircase in southern Utah. There is no way to explain that missing mile layer of sediment that is nowhere to be found other than massive sheet-fed flooding on a global scale. Submarine canyons attest to the flood where most major rivers enter into the oceans off the continents. Under the surface, there are huge canyons. Some are three times the size of Grand Canyon, but the currents are only going about a mile an hour, and the missing sediments are nowhere to be found. Those were dug out very quickly the last time the waters ran off the continents. Well, the Ice Age ended, and the world was divided in the days of Peleg. Who's Peleg? Well, in Genesis, we're told unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, which means divided, for in his days... The earth was divided. This was a couple hundred years after the flood, and at the Tower of Babel, languages were confused, and people were split up by languages and nations. At that time, the ocean waters were about 400 feet lower than they are today, so people could walk all around the globe. They were spread out around the globe, and during Peleg's lifetime, the, think about this, the cooling oceans led to less evaporation, and the Ice Age ended, and the ice caps began melting, and separated people by languages, nations, islands, and continents. In fact, this textbook says 20,000 years ago, it was 4,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. Ice masses melted and sea level rose. <laughs> this happened about 4,000 years ago. And man-made structures on continental shelves attest to this fact. A lot of folks built their settlements next to the water source, but the rising waters buried their settlements, they had to move to higher ground. Now, if the strata layers were laid down during a global flood, we should find sedimentary layers in a mixed order around the globe, not the nice, neat order of the geologic column. We should find millions of fossils in those layers that were buried during the flood. We should find some extinct life forms that couldn't adjust to the post-flood era. But we should find no missing links of one kind evolving into another. We should find the ocean floor dwelling creatures in the lowest layers, that's where they lived, with marine fossils through all layers and the land dwellers in the upper layers as they can move to higher and higher ground. We should find polystrata fossils that traverse multiple strata layers and carbon-14 in the same range of amount from the top layers through to the bottom layers. And this is exactly what is found. If those layers form slowly over long ages, none of these things should be found. Only a global flood can explain the overwhelming evidence we can find.
And unless you think you can't be scientific and believe in a young earth, the only difference in the geological periods, in which the names are important for study, to have something to go back to, is basically the amount of time it took for each layer to form and what event formed them. You can be perfectly scientific and believe in a young earth creation. Blaise Pascal, Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, on and on we could go. The global flood explains fossil graveyards, the mountain ranges, the submarine canyons, the coal and the oil deposits, the ice age effects, the geologic compression events, and the three-day formation of Grand Canyon. Yet those with a closed evolutionary mindset will scoff at the overwhelming evidence of the global flood because it destroys the old earth beliefs and Darwinism right along with it. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that perfect will of God. Don't let secular philosophies undermine your faith in the word of your creator. Flood evidence should remind us of God's past and his coming judgments of sin. In Exodus 20, we're given the Ten Commandments. The first is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second is that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything. In other words, the first two commandments are we are to worship nothing and no other deity, only our biblical creator, redeeming savior, Jesus Christ. And in the middle of the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, verse 11, we're told, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Make sure that that is the God you are worshiping. In the days of Elijah, the Israelites were mixing in pagan beliefs with the scriptural God. They were making up this God they were worshiping, and that was not acceptable to God. And Elijah said to the people, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If not, follow Baal. In other words, don't sit there and have one foot in the secular camp and one foot in the biblical camp. Humble yourselves to the word of God, because I'm telling you right now, if you really look at the evidences, you will find the word of God always stands up to real science. It's only the false science that undermines people's faith. Jesus said that you are to be the salt of the earth. You know, if salt gets into an open wound, it might sting a little bit, but it also cleanses and preserves. When someone said to me, and I was a theistic evolutionist, and I owned my own nationwide company, and I was a trustee in my church, and someone said to me, you're wrong about evolution. You need to look at the, what this creation speaker has to say. I thought they were crazy. They didn't know what they were talking about, but I looked at it, and it changed my life to where I gave my business away, and now I spend my time trying to get people to see we're being misled by secular teachings. We are to be the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be strewn on the ground and trampled under the foot of man. Let's humble ourselves to the word of God, because by learning real science, we can chop down the false science and the thorn bush of Darwinism and that's millions of years as well as the Darwinian beliefs. And then the soil is ready for the planting of the seed, God's word. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the awesome information you've given to us so that we can believe your word and we can see the truth of your word. We truly are without excuse for not accepting your word, word for word and cover to cover. Dear Father, please give us the strength through the Holy Spirit to humble ourselves and put our faith completely in your Son, Lord Jesus. It is in his great name that I do pray. Amen. Amen.